We just finished discussing the police. The police law enforcement falls under our executive branch. We're going to switch gears and talk about the judicial branch and specifically the judicial system and what makes up the judicial system. Generally, there are 52 different judicial systems in the United States, one for the federal system and one for each state and the District of Columbia. There's also a federal system in the District of Columbia as well. And each system is divided into two distinct sets. There's trial courts and there's appellate courts. In jurisdiction, what is jurisdiction? We're going to hear this word a lot um, as it relates to courts, jurisdiction versus the law enforcement's jurisdiction, the area where they cover. It's very similar, but it's a court's authority to hear a case. And some courts have limited jurisdiction, meaning they can only hear certain types of case. Other courts have general jurisdiction, which means they can hear just about everything. Um, an example of a limited jurisdiction court would be traffic court. They only hear traffic cases. Small claims courts can only hear civil disputes up to a certain amount of money, depending on where you are. That could be $3,000, and that could, or it could be $5,000. New York State has only a, fed, uh, a felony court, which is uh, called count, and I'll show you the court system. But before I expand a little bit more on the different courts, the federal system and the state system operate independently of each other. The federal court system can't trump the state court system. They each have to they each follow their own laws under their jurisdiction. Federal court hears federal cases. State court hears the state cases. So states are free to develop their own court system, and Congress is free to develop the federal court system and we'll switch we're going to talk specifically about the states and then we'll switch and talk about the federal court system and there are a slew of variety of cases as you can imagine and I already kind of alluded to a limited jurisdiction the courts are restricted to what they hear so I'm going to expand on the types of courts and where their jurisdiction lies in New York State so New York State as I started to say does have its own felony court. It's called county court. They have a Supreme Court, which is uh, our trial court level. We'll talk specifically about the difference between trial courts and appellate courts. Um, there is a family court. And intertwined in all these courts is some relationship to criminal law, okay? Back to felony court, they will only hear felony cases. Occasionally, and it's rare, they'll hear a misdemeanor, and that's usually because the case started as a felony and then was reduced in some fashion, either by a motion on the court or the prosecutor decided that it wasn't at the felony level. Um, but generally, they only hear the felony criminal cases, and it could be the serious felonies, they can be the non-serious felonies, it's a felony court. And when, within this court is uh, something called our treatment court or specialty courts. Uh, they call them drug courts, they call them mental health courts, there's community courts, there's domestic violence courts, there's gun courts that should be up here, veterans courts. We have a veteran court here in, in upstate New York and, and other counties too. Essex County is the the court in the northern New York that has a veterans court. And these are, and they have a catch-all name of, they call them treatment courts. Rather than your case, uh, a case being treated as a, if somebody's charged with a felony, and rather than them being sentenced to prison, they may be able to participate in one of these programs and then ultimately have their case dismissed or their charges 
dropped. We'll talk a little bit more specifically about specialty courts um, coming up. Our Supreme Court, while it's our court of general jurisdiction, which means it can hear everything, it can hear divorce cases, it can hear civil claims cases, it can hear real estate cases, there is a branch of our Supreme Court called the Integrated Domestic Violence Court, and this is a court that hears criminal cases involving domestic violence, and it can be as low as a violation harassment up to a serious felony. And this includes uh, uh, sex offenses, and it could include sex offenses involving children. Uh, our family court is a court that hears all sorts of family ma uh, matters, including support or custody, but they also hear juvenile delinquency cases. And in New York State, we have a youth court that hears the crimes involving 16 to 18-year-olds or delinqu juvenile delinquency. Here's our 13 to 15 cases involving our offenders between the ages of 13 and 15. So, regardless of these, these courts, these trial courts, lower courts, these, that's what these all are, I just explained. These are the, case, the courts that hear the cases first, okay? And what I mean by first is they are the trial courts versus our appellate courts. And the trial court hears everything. They hear the facts, they hear the law. The appellate court is only going to hear the law. Trial court is where it all happens. This is where the facts are happening. This is where the judge um, instructs a jury on what the law is that they have to apply. So let's take an example. Joe Smith allegedly murdered Susie Jones. People call because the prosecutor has to be the one to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. So the people, the prosecutor, calls you know the, the officer who did the investigation as a witness. They call the neighbor who heard scuffling and arguing. The man standing on the corner of the street saw Smith run out of the apartment building where Jones lived. The knife with some substance found on it was at the scene. And that substance appeared to be blood, which was then tested. So a lab report was brought into, uh, into the case. And it also had Jones's DNA on it. They found a fingerprint, they took a fingerprint off the knife and the lab report had indicated that the print belonged to Smith. Okay, those are facts. Those, that's all that information created a factual record. Those are the facts and how the facts get recorded. There's a, a person that sits in the courtroom and it takes, takes all this down, the transcriptionist, the court reporter. Um, that individual usually sits right below the judge, takes all this information in. They also collect any uh, exhibits, such as the weapon, the knife. It would be marked as an exhibit. And uh, any photographs that might come in, all of the tangible items are facts. Okay? And it's up to the jury or whoever's deciding the case. The judge can decide the case, too. It you know, depending on uh, the choice, but we're, it's criminal law, and we're going to always say jury, because somebody, the defendant has a right, constitutional right to a jury trial. Can they waive it? Sure. Does it happen? Yeah, rarely, but it, we're going to stick with the jury in uh, criminal cases deciding the facts, okay? So the judge gives the jury the law instructions of what they have to apply, and they make a decision. In a criminal case, it has to be a unanimous decision. And let's say they find the defendant, in my example, guilty. The defendant gets to appeal and gets to take their case up to a higher court or an appellate court. And it's the appellate court's job to determine if the law used was correct or if the judge made any legal error. This isn't a retrial where all this stuff comes in again and we start all over again. Nope, they review the record. Where does the record come from? That 
individual who is transcribing the case sends all of the exhibits and a printout of what was said in court and done in court gets sent to the appellate court and the appellate court reviews whether or not there was any errors made it is not the appellate court's job to say yeah the jury got that completely wrong we're going to change it that doesn't happen that's not their job their job is to say "Ooh." The judge made a mistake in ruling on the law or allowing this piece of evidence to come in and it was highly prejudicial. Maybe it wasn't irrelevant and that could have affected the jury's decision. So in that case, we are going to overturn it. They can also say, oh, the attorney for the defendant fell asleep at the wheel and didn't make the appropriate objections, which was prejudicial to the defendant and therefore that's a violation of due process, right? So that's what the appellate court does. They don't do a, a complete do-over. They review whether there was any errors made at the trial court. So, oh, this is our, this is a general structure. And this is, comes from the, the book of how state courts are, uh, their hierarchy is um, the bottom is our limited jurisdiction kind of cases we have our our lower courts sometimes called the common pleas and they have limited jurisdiction might just hear misdemeanor cases um, I'm going to show you the New York State makeup of cases oops that's a little blurry but this is what New York State Unified Court System looks like um, but in a general sense you need to know that each state has a trial court and appellate court at a minimum do they have other courts that separate types of cases out yes they do New York seems to have a very complicated uh, puzzle of cases we have uh, our New York City civil court we have a new york city criminal court they hear low-level criminal cases misdemeanors traffic infractions violations things of that nature there are city courts and town courts that should also say town and village courts and that's upstate new york the city of plattsburgh has a court the town of plattsburgh has a court the village of danamora has a court so all of the municipalities have some low-level courts they also hear the traffic cases uh, you know they'll hear small claims cases they might hear a landlord tenant case they hear misdemeanor uh, cases as well district courts is out on the island um, they're low level courts for misdemeanors and traffics and small claims and evictions are in the district courts then we have court of claims which is if you want to stu sue the state for anything surrogates court here's things like probates and guardianships our family court here's the family court I already mentioned that here's our family court cases county court here's our felony criminal cases and our Supreme Court is the one that hears um, everything the court of juris uh, general jurisdiction they can hear any any kind of case uh, and the Supreme Court the county court the family court the surrogates court and the court of claims if any cases come out of there they go to the appellate division so our, our in my example if we were in county court uh, on the jones the jones case um, people versus smith i think was my my case uh, the defendant lost they would appeal to the appellate division as of right as of right you get a first bite at the appeals apple and new york is also has a higher level court of appeals that hears anything that comes out of those appellate divisions they can hear but you have to ask for it it's not a freebie it's not automatic if you lose the appellate division you have to ask for them to hear the case and it has to be based on some violation of the constitution of new york state constitution for them to take a case so that's the general makeup of new york state court system 
I want to kind of revamp to specialty courts because it's very important as we talk about criminal criminal law. Um, page 61 in the book talks about the specialty court in Queens. I think it's kind of simplified. I want to expand on it a little, little bit more. Um, the rules and procedure of how to get into a special, uh, specialty court are laid out in statute in the uh, criminal procedure book in New York State. It's primarily for nonviolent drug offenders, usually first time offenders. Um, when they join the program, their case is not closed yet. It's not at the stage of um, where they're sentenced and then they have a criminal record. What happens is the individual has taken a plea 99% of the time. They would have to take a plea. Rarely have I seen somebody get a treatment court option who's gone to trial. Um, I'm not saying it's not available because it, by law it is available but it's rarely implemented. It's usually by plea because somebody admits that they've sold drugs or they use drugs or they've got a drug problem. They possessed, you know, the cocaine or the heroin, whatever it was, um, and that they need assistance. That's usually the first kind of indication that somebody would be appropriate for a specialty court. Um, or they suffer from some sort of um, mental health issue that is not subject to, it could be subject to, but not necessarily subject to an argument or a defense for insanity. Um, because there are some, you know, people suffer from mental health issues that do not give rise to uh, that type of defense in a trial, or if it does, they don't necessarily want to go to trial because the outcome could be worse if the jury doesn't believe that was the, the, the cause. So nonetheless, that would be mental health court. So once uh, that happens, they've taken a plea, but the judge doesn't sentence them. What happens is they get placed in the program. It can last 12 to 18 months, at least in New York, sometimes longer. But after the two-year mark, there's there's question about whether or not the person's even being compliant. Because um, usually if it extends too long, there's a lot of non-compliant issues that are involved. And the person is monitored by probation. So you're not sentenced to probation, but they're the monitoring source. They have to report to court and they have to go to treatment. And... Um, it isn't ultimately the judge's decision to decide whether someone should be on a treatment court. There's a team. There's a team of people that make up the treatment court program. There's the prosecutor sits on it. Defense attorney gets to sit on it. There's a coordinator for the court system that funnels the paperwork. Probation sits on it. Treatment facilities in an area governed under New York State law. There's members of law enforcement on it, and they review an uh, individual's application for consideration, determining whether, you know, they could be successful, you know, what kind of record, do they have any track record in treatment? Um, is there actually a diagnosis for some sort of, you know, whatever issue that might be, a, a mental health issue or, you know, a drug abuse issue? Are they a concern for the safety? Is there a uh, safety concern for the public? Um, do they have to go inside a residential treatment while they are doing, you know, this program? And one of the requirements is they have to reside in the jurisdiction of the court. Otherwise, the court can't monitor somebody. So that's, that's a key component, okay? So I'll let you read the information on 161 and then ask you whether or not do you think these courts are a good thing. Do you think, you know, you go to court on a case, you work through a program, you complete each stage, you get to the next level. It takes, you know, 12 to 18 months, like I said. Um, there's constant judicial monitoring. There's also the possibility of having no criminal record because the case can either be dismissed by the judge in the end or the judge can reduce the charge to a lower charge and then seal the record. That's another 
option for somebody who completes the treatment program. The flip side of this, that all sounds great, and it is great. It's a great concept. Um, there's been a lot of research on whether or not um, it helps with reoffending, because I've certainly represented people who have gone through these types of programs, successfully graduate, only to be back in the system again a year later. Um, in the court system, I mean, getting charged and having to kind of jump through the loops again. You don't get a second bite at the treatment uh, court option again. So, But then I, on the other side, I've had people go through the program, get their lives together, go off to college, get degrees, and do awesome things. So it's, you know, it's certainly a, a resource. And I should tell you, though, the flip side is the program is not completed. There is the most most likely option is the person ends up incarcerated. It's kind of an all all or nothing uh, sort of uh, deal. All right, treatment courts. Let's talk about Supreme Court. Oh, well, yeah, I'm getting to the Supreme Court. I guess I'll, I'll give a little intro to the federal courts, and then I want to talk about the Supreme Court, and then I'll jump back to our federal courts. The U.S. Constitution calls for one single court. That's what it says. One single court, the Supreme Court. The Constitution also allows Congress to create or abolish federal courts. So the Congress has created a system of courts to complement the Supreme Court. And as I said earlier, each state and D.C. has a federal court system. Okay. Um, I, I'll touch on what's on the screen now, but I'll revisit it after we talk about the Supreme Court. Uh, we have U.S. district courts. And again, their courts are, are also divided into trial courts and appeals court. The district courts are the trial courts, the low courts. That's where everything is heard. That's where you find the juries. The U.S. Court of Appeals is the appeals court, and the appeals court hears those appeals that come from district courts. Now, there's a, you know, a larger number of U.S. district courts than there are court of appeals. So the court of appeals system isn't broken down as each state has its own appellate court. The appellate court is broken up into uh, circuits or judicial circuits. So a group of states could be part of a circuit. New York is part of the second circuit along with Vermont and Connecticut. So Vermont, Connecticut, New York, federal court, district court cases get appealed to the second circuit, for example. I'll show you a chart of the federal court uh, at the, the for federal court system at the end. And bigger states have more than one district court. New York has four. Northern, Southern, Eastern, Western district courts. And then our Court of Appeals, which is the Second Circuit, which is in New York City, um, is the appeals court. The types of cases that federal courts hear, there's about uh, se there's seven types of cases, their jurisdiction the authority to hear these cases. I am only going to tell you about three, the three most common ones, and then out of those three, two only relate to criminal law. So the three are cases that arise out of the U.S. Constitution, U.S. laws, or the U.S. treaties, i.e. a federal question. Is that, is that statute unconstitutional? Right? Did that action violate my right to free speech or due process? The Second one is cases involving controversies when the United States is a party to the case. In a criminal case, the United States is always a party to the case because that's who's bringing the case. They're the prosecutor, the government versus Jones, government versus Smith. So whenever there is a criminal case, the United States is a party, the federal court will have jurisdiction. And then cases involving controversies between citizens of different states and the money involved is over $75,000. That's related to our civil, civil type cases. So if I want to sue a company in California for, let's say, a breach of contract or negligence because I was hurt by a product that was made 
uh, by a company in California. I would have to sue in federal court because I'm in New York, the company's in California, and I'd have to ask for more than $75,000. So I say I want a million dollars for my injuries. That would be in federal court. But the two that we're concerned with with federal court is number one and number two, right? Cases involving the, uh, involving the U.S. and cases on, that fall under the U.S. Constitution or violation thereof. So let's talk about these folks. And I want to direct you to, there's a link to the U.S. Supreme Court website. You should familiarize yourself with these individuals. Uh, they make, they are in charge of making very important decisions that guide the laws of our country. And we are going to dive in and talk about the Supreme Court why do we have a Supreme Court and its importance? Where is the Supreme Court? Who is the Supreme Court? When does the Supreme Court hear a case? And how does the Supreme Court work? Meaning, how does it choose its cases? So what is the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court is the highest court in the country. And I'm just going to give you a side note. There is one court that's higher than the United States Supreme Court, and that is a basketball court that sits above the Supreme Court building or where these justices have their, their courtroom. So there's actually one slightly higher court. Uh, the highest court is in the judicial branch of government and its official duty is to interpret laws through the Constitution. So issues such as, you know, public school desegregation was a big issue. Gay okay, marriage is an issue. Miranda, we talked about the Miranda rights and illegal search and seizure, all of those things have been decided uh, by the Supreme Court or stem from Supreme Court cases. So why do we have a Supreme Court? Why is it, why is it important? It's usually seen as a last resort for justice. And any case either coming from the state court system or the federal court system can get to the United States Supreme Court system. So let's take a, a case, a criminal case that started in New York, my New York State versus Smith case example that I, g I gave a little while ago. That gets, a, he loses, the jury finds the defendant guilty. He appeals to the appellate court in New York and they find that there was no error made. He makes an appeal to the New York State Court of Appeals claiming there was a violation of his New York State uh, constitutional rights to due process, let's say. Um, you know, his attorney made a gazillion mistakes and that affected the jury's decision. And they take the case, they review the case, and they say, yeah, no, there was no violation of the New York State Constitution. At that point, he could ask, the defendant could ask the Supreme Court to hear his case. He could. And I'm going to put that on hold for one moment when we talk about how, how that happens. So I just want to point out that in what I'm pointing out is that the U.S. Supreme Court can hear cases that come out of state court as well as federal court. So it would go to the circuit court and then a request to the U.S. Supreme Court. So they are the Supreme Court in the land and they can hear cases that come from the state or the federal court system. So it is the power of the Supreme Court. The power of the Supreme Court is known as judicial review. And it's the ability of the court to declare legislation or you know, a law passed by Congress or you know, some executive act by the president in violation of the Constitution. And this doctrine was established in 1803, the case May Mayberry, Marbury versus Madison, that said that they are the Supreme Court and the supreme decider of whether or not laws are constitutional or not. And as we've as I've already talked about, even when we talked about it in the last section, its decisions have an important impact on society, right? It serves to ensure that the changing views of a majority do not undermine the fundamental values common to all Americans, like free speech, free religion, due process. That's 
That's their job. Where is it? Where's the Supreme Court? It's in Washington, D.C. It used to be in the Capitol building until it moved to its own building in 1935. It's got its own space. Before that, it was in uh, Philadelphia. And then before that, it was in New York City. It moved to D.C. in the 1800s. In 1800. So... Who, how many justices make up the Supreme Court? Do you remember our picture, the picture I just had up? There are nine, nine justices. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was John Roberts, and then eight associate justices. Oddly, the Constitution does not specify how many the Supreme Court should have. The actual original court in 1789 had seven just justices it's also had as little as five and as large as ten um, and just after the civil war congress stated that nine uh, is the magic number and that's what it's been ever since so how does one become a supreme court justice presidential appointment and following the last uh three and a half years uh two Justices have been appointed to the Supreme Court by the by the president. So the president nominates and the Senate gets to advise and consent to the appointment. Do you think there's any significance with having a president nominate a justice? What might a president look for in a nominee? Does political affiliation play a part in this appointment? I'm not going to answer these questions now. These are going to be something you're going to think about. It's going to be part of the forum post assignment, I think, this week. Can justices change their views over time? Sure. Justice Kennedy has done. He's He started as a conservative appointment and tends to be a little bit more on the liberal side these days. But I really want you to think about how political affiliation plays plays a part in appointing these judges because these folks have an impact on what the laws are going to be that have to be followed in this country, what's constitutional, what's not constitutional. So what are the requirements to qualify to be a Supreme Court justice? None. There are none. There's no age requirement. There's no specific education. There's no job experience. There's no citizenship rules. But obviously, these days, you know, Senate hearings and confirmation, they're looking into background and experience. Those things are considered. And, but it's only been since 1957 that all justices had a law degree. It's not necessary to have a law degree or even be an, an attorney. How long are their terms? No terms. They're life appointed. They're there for life. Can they ever be removed? Yes, uh, impeachment, they have to be impeached. It's very hard to do. It's harder to remove a Supreme Court justice than it is to remove president. The last justice imp impeached and removed from the bench was in 1805. So when they're there, they are there. So when does the Supreme Court hear a case? Important stuff. All of that was important stuff. But let's get a case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction of cases, okay? They are a court of original jurisdiction. That's what the Constitution gave them, meaning it can hear a case right from the start. The Constitution gave them that power, okay? Uh, but it was Congress that gave them their appellate power, and that's primarily what they do. So their appellate jurisdiction, as it was created by Congress, and now their focus is primarily hearing appeals from lower federal courts and state courts. And they are very limited in the kinds of cases that they will hear. So there's two ways to get there. You know, direct, direct appeal which is not the most common one because they just don't take cases uh, on hand. 
And the other one is called a writ of certiorari, or a writ of cert, C-E-R-T, writ of cert, or a writ for short. They say we got a petition for a writ, I meaning you got to ask permission. The one who wants to, the Supreme Court to hear the case has to ask. So let's talk about it. It's a discretionary order. This writ is a discretionary by the court. And as I said, it must be requested by the party who wants the court, the court to hear it. The parties, any of the parties could be a defendant, an individual, you know, a defendant. It could be a state government. Um, the federal government is represented by the Solicitor General when the case involves the United States. So, and two thirds of the case involves the United States, of course, because all, all of the criminal cases involve the US, but it's not the um, attorney who handled the case for the US. The Solicitor General will come in and, and argue the case at the Supreme Court for the, for the government. And where do these cases come from? They can come from the federal court or the state court. And it can be a civil case or a criminal issue, but it has to address a constitutional issue. So let's go back to my state, New York State versus Smith case. He just finished up appealing to the New York State Court of Appeals. He has nowhere left to go. Okay, nowhere left to go. When somebody doesn't have anywhere left to go, it means they have exhausted all of their legal remedies available to them. So that has to happen first. They have to show that they have jumped through all of these hoops before they can ask the United States Supreme Court to hear their case. They have to exhaust all their legal remedies. And then they have to make a petition or a request for this discretionary order or this writ of cert and say, look, there's a constitutional issue here. My constitutional right to due process was violated when my attorney messed up these five things and because of those errors the jury found me guilty okay so let's talk about how they choose the case and like i said it is extremely difficult and they usually hear the ones that pose difficult questions or very or that that are very controversial okay they receive over 7000 petitions a year 7,000, but they only accept about 100, 100 to 50, 150 max, but around 100, 107. In most instances, they won't hear cases that will undermine the legitimacy of the court. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, desegregation was a big issue, same-sex same marriage, abortion is always a big issue, right of free speech is always a big issue, they always have one of those. Most recently, they, uh, in a criminal case, they held that a, it's um, a violation of the Eighth Amendment, uh, or the Sixth Amendment, sorry, the right to a jury trial, when you have a rule, there was two states Oregon and Louisiana that did not require a unanimous jury verdict in a criminal case, just a majority. And the United States Supreme Court said, no, that was unconstitutional. Did that back in March, I believe. So unanimous jury verdict. How do you get a writ? Well, so you petition the court and all nine justices review that writ and four of them must think that it has merit, the rule of four. If four of them agree, it's coming in to be heard. Usually it's cases where there's a split decision in the lower courts. So our appellate courts, our circuit courts, um, New York, you know, the New York Circuit Court is Second Circuit rules in a certain way with regards to an issue. With that same issue, the Ninth Circuit comes a different way or the Third Circuit comes a different way where our, the appellate courts differ on the outcome or the decision they will take a case and settle it basically uh federal questions you know this is unconstitutional violation of free speech this this legislative law that makes uh, abortion illegal completely 
could be appealed. There's a lot of laws that are coming up the pike with regards to um, tweaking the laws and rules relative to abortion. Uh, cases of first impression, meaning there's no precedent. No decision has ever been made on this kind of issue. Those are the kinds of things they hear. So let's say they grant it. Okay, what happens next? Cases in the Supreme Court. The parties submit that record from that lower court. They prepare some briefs for the justices and they go and argue their case. Sometimes organizations who have an interest in the outcome, amicus, amicus brief, friends of the court, they'll be allowed to file a brief for the Supreme Court to consider. And then they make a decision, okay? Their decision, they have, you know, a, they'll write an opinion. They have a majority opinion. That's where one justice writes and the other ones sign on. There's concurring opinions where a judge may agree with the outcome, but not the reasons why they got there. And then, you know, there's dissenting opinions where justice doesn't agree at all. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is notorious for writing dissenting opinions. And her hope, you know, the hopes are when they write dissenting opinions, it flags legislators to say, oh, maybe we should tweak this law if they agree with the dissent. Can there ever be a tie when there's nine justices? Yes. One might recuse themselves, him or herself, and say they can't impartially review this for, you know, personal reasons. One might, they're, they're, recently there was eight on the, a couple years ago, not really recently, there was eight justices when uh, Justice Scalia passed away. So yeah, it can end in a tie. So what happens with the decision? If there's a split decision, a 4-4 effectively upholds the ruling of the lower court. So that's what happens. The, the lower court's decision will stand. All right, what types of cases involving criminal justice could and would they hear, would they choose to hear? Fourth Amendment, illegal search and seizure, they hear those. Fifth Amendment with regards to Miranda warnings. Uh, Sixth Amendment, they just heard, with regards to uh, right of counsel and um, right to a jury. And Eighth Amendment issues, um, harsh and excessive punishment, unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment. So let's talk a little long-winded on the Supreme Court, but it's a very important court to know about because they make a lot of decisions regarding criminal law. So this is our makeup of our Supreme Court. Um, our district, I mean, they have their specialty courts, the military courts, they have a Veteran Court of Appeals and the Tax Court, the U.S. District Courts, the 94 districts, and they each have a bankruptcy court, with something we're not dealing with, obviously. But the U.S. District Courts, we are. And then our U.S. Court of Appeals and our United States Supreme Court. District Courts are those trial courts for the civil and criminal matters, as I mentioned, and each state has, has at least one bigger states are, are broken up and our district courts have within them magistrate judges magistrate judges hear those smaller types of cases misdemeanors they might do hearings uh, and then our district court judges we have magistrates and then we have our judges and they hear everything else the court of appeals divided into circuits there are 13 the biggest circuit is the ninth circuit with california alaska arizona and hawaii and New York, very important, is in the Second Circuit, which is New York, Connecticut, and Vermont. Both of those circuits seem to always fall on, they always seem to conflict with their, with their rulings. Um, federal judges, the Federal District Court and the Court of Appeal judges are appointed for life by the President. Again, with the advice and consent of the Senate. And if you follow the news, if you're big into the court system, they are constantly right now trying to fill positions very quickly with conservative appointments across the, across the country. But they also need consent of the state Senate, not just the federal Senate. If they're going to appoint a federal judge that's going to be in New York State, they need the consent of New York Senate as well. Again, not much qualifications are needed relative to that. Magistrates are appointed by a panel of district judges in the district, and the magistrates have term limits. They have four years, and they must be reappointed. 
and all of these federal judges can only be removed by impeachment. So that is our judicial court system. Uh, we are going to move on to the judiciary. We're going to talk about judges and court staff and prosecutors in the next slide. And then after that, we're going to talk about the defense counsel and court administration.